Good evening, I'm Hartford HealthCare's Tina Verona. Well, last year, Hartford Hospital physicians performed more than 1,300 heart rhythm procedures, real leading edge procedures that are showing promising results and really making a difference in a patient's recovery. Joining me tonight is Dr. Eric Crespo. He is the director of Hartford Hospital's Interventional Electrophysiology Labs. It's so nice to have you here with us, Dr. Crespo. Thank you. So lots to tackle tonight. Um, there is one procedure that we want to start off with, um, the cryo balloon procedure. And this is really showing promising results um, in terms of the way you perform procedures, quicker um, uh, response time to performing these procedures, um, as well as for patients. So first off, explain for our viewers what is the cryoballoon procedure. So cardiac ablation is in general a procedure where we're putting catheters up into the heart from veins in the legs in order to create scars to get rid of areas that are causing the rhythm problem. Depending on the rhythm, it can vary where we're going to do this uh, scar creation. For atrial fibrillation, the primary source of the triggers for the rhythm problem is an area called the pulmonary veins, which are the veins that bring blood back to the heart after it's gone to the lungs. So traditionally, we would go into the heart and create scars around these veins in a point-to-point -point fashion, doing one spot at a time and really linking all these little scars together to create big encircling lesions around the veins to kind of corral them off, if, if you will, from the rest of the heart. This is very effective, but it takes a lot of time and, and precision to do this. And procedures would often be over four hours mm -hmm. for a lot of cases, um, sometimes longer depending on anatomy. The cryo balloon system is uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a balloon that goes in and actually goes to the opening of the vein and inflates and then refrigerant is pumped into the balloon to bring it to an extremely cold temperature, which then freezes the tissue all around the vein simultaneously, allowing creation of those scars all at once, essentially. So instead of lots of little spots, we create several large spots and do the same procedure in much less time more efficiently. Yeah, because you're covering the area and you're getting it at one shot. Right. You don't have exactly. to go individually um, to target these areas. Exactly. Now in traditional radio frequency ablation you would use heat, but here right. you're using the exact opposite and you're freezing it. Right. And it's extreme cold, so it's mm -hmm. down to negative 50 degrees. It's very, very cold, but it achieves the same goal, which is basically destroying the tissue in that location. Now why the difference in temperature? Well, extreme heat is you know, what you think of with cauterizing something. Mm -hmm. uh, the extreme or cold, it, it basically right. extreme cold is the same as a burn as far as the tissue is concerned. Right. And so with this shorter time um, in, in the electrophysiology lab with the procedure, mm -hmm. what does that mean for patients? I would imagine it would mean a quicker recovery in the end because they're, they're, um, it's a quicker procedure. Yeah, so I think a big thing for patients is these are p procedures done under general anesthesia. So you're looking at, you know, when we did it the traditional way, four hours or more of general anesthesia, yeah. which takes a while to get its sure. way through the body. Here you're looking at less than two hours in most cases, sometimes closer to one hour of anesthesia. Um, so it's a much faster recovery from the patient point of view. Yeah, and you were the, um, the first doctors here in the greater Hartford area to perform this cryo-balloon procedure, which is exciting here at Hartford Hospital. Um, and how have the patients uh, been doing as a result of, of this procedure? So we've been doing this now since earlier this year, mm -hmm. uh, and the results have been great. I mean, we've always had very good outcomes with AFib ablation, but it's been really great to see the patients move through the procedure quickly, recover very quickly. Uh, they're up and doing normal activities the next day, essentially, just with very limited restrictions. Yeah, so talk to us about, um, again, um, in terms of radio frequency, ablation, cryo-balloon. Is this sort of now going to be the gold standard in how we do ablations, or are we still going to be doing radio frequency ablations? There's, there's a role for both, and mm -hmm. it really depends on the particular patient situation. So in some cases, you really need to use traditional radio frequency ablation because the, the cryo-balloon is very good at the one thing it's meant to do, which is isolate those veins, that area around the veins. It doesn't do anything else. And so some patients with atrial fibrillation or other rhythm disorders need us to target other areas, in which case the flexibility of the traditional ablation techniques is much more effective. Yeah, we are talking with Dr. Eric Crespo of um, our electrophysiology um, labs here at Hartford Hospital. Um, we invite you to ask Dr. Crespo a question in our Facebook Live um, discussion. And we, uh, it looks like we have a question from Melissa. And actually, I was going to ask this. How do you know if you are a good candidate? Thanks, Melissa. Good question. She's reading my mind. So 
In general, when you present with atrial fibrillation, we start by looking for reversible causes, things that we can fix more easily, like thyroid problems, things mm -hmm. like that. We also look at other lifestyle factors, you know, simple things like exercise and weight loss, you know, traditional heart healthy things. And we start with medications. And it's when those those initial conservative efforts fail is when we start talking about doing procedures. Now atrial fibrillation, of course, is a heart rhythm disorder. Mm -hmm. Is this something that's hereditary or can you develop it later in life? What, what sort it's of thing? both. Yeah. So in some cases, there's definitely a family association where you have families with multiple family members. Um, but it's also a very common disorder that arises from a lot of the other same risk factors that lead to other heart problems. So getting older, having diabetes, having high blood pressure, uh, not watching what you eat, high cholesterol, all those things can bring you to atrial fibrillation. So everybody's path there is different. Is different. Um, well, let's talk about symptoms, signs, warning signs. Um, can, can you feel an abnormal heart rhythm? Can you feel uh, either trachycardia or brachycardia, a fast rhythm? So some people do feel like a flip-flopping sensation in mm -hmm. their chest, uh, but it's actually a misconception that most people feel that. A lot of patients will present and, and they'll say, well, I didn't feel anything. I was unaware that I had this. But when you drill down and ask them about how they're feeling in general, they'll often report that they've been feeling more tired. They have less stamina with activities. They're a little more short of breath walking up that hill or walking upstairs. Or at the end of the day, they just have no energy. Um, and those are actually the most common complaints that I hear. And AFib, um, a heart rhythm disorder, is, is not something to ignore because, as we know, it could lead to stroke, it could lead to blood clots or heart complications. Um, when should someone seek help, or, or if they don't necessarily have symptoms, could they not have symptoms, or, or, or were they so most somebody, likely have symptoms? Some patients are truly asymptomatic, but that's less common. Mm -hmm. um, but it, for most patients, they'll present with some of these vague symptoms of more tired or more short of breath, or they'll have palpitations, skipping heartbeats. So they should be getting their you know, annual physicals with their doctor where it could be detected. But if they have symptoms like I'm describing, they should speak to their doctor to be screened. Yeah, absolutely. Now in my introduction, I, I mentioned that 1,300 heart rhythm procedures were performed last year here at Hartford Hospital. So the demand is growing and it's and there's more folks out there that do need these heart rhythm procedures. And to meet that growing demand, uh, Hartford Hospital needed to sort of expand the existing blueprint, if you will, of our electrophysiology labs and even add a third lab. Right. So talk to us about that. And, and really, it's sort of um, care by specialists all in one area that is so vital. Right. So it, in the past, we had state-of-the-art labs where we did these procedures, um, but due to um, just setting up in the hospital, we had patients checking in in one area, recovering in another, and families waiting in another area. And this was not the most efficient way to care for these people. So as part of meeting the growing demand, we built a third lab, again, state-of-the-art lab, but now we have the pre- and post-op recovery area right there across the hall from the procedural area. The patient family waiting area is right there. So when patients come in and check in, they have their entire experience right in that one part of the hospital. So it's very efficient in terms of movement of the patient and family. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's there at once. It's easy to talk to families after the procedure. Uh, it's just a better experience for the patient. The staff is also dedicated to only heart rhythm procedures. There are not people having other kinds of procedures right. here. It's all heart rhythm staff who are experts in, in taking care of these kinds of situations. Yeah, so any question you may have or if anything arises at the time, it's comforting to know that there are specialists that are there taking care of you and they know exactly what to do in a case like that. Um, let's talk about um, some other uh, interesting, unique procedures that we're doing here in the electrophysiology lab here at Hartford Hospital. The leadless procedure um, pacemaker, which, you know, as, as you know, there are leads and to, to connect pacemakers, but this one does not have leads. Talk to us right. about that, so that's interesting. A traditional pacemaker going back to, you know, more than 50 years has had wires or leads that go into the heart. Mm -hmm. Usually the pacemaker is somewhere on the upper chest and the wires go into the blood vessels from the arms and it goes into the heart. Some patients don't have access because they've had problems with the blood vessels or have other uh, conditions. And so a leadless pacemaker allows us to put a tiny pacemaker directly into the heart. The entire thing is self-contained uh, and it is implanted into the heart from the blood vessels in the legs. Um, there's no wires at all involved. And so it, it allows us to offer pacemakers to patients that traditionally wouldn't be able to get them easily. Um, and it also avoids some of the problems that can come up with leads. 
So that's exciting for patients that do, could not have a pacemaker before. What, what would, would they do before? Well, there, there would be ways to get the pacemakers yeah. into patients, but they would often be more convoluted in some cases in mm -hmm. terms of implanting them in unusual locations, um, or they would run the risk of more complications with trying to get leads into the heart. So this avoids a lot of that. Yeah, that's exciting for those for that patient population. We have another um, comment and a question twofold from Val. She says, uh, hey, Dr. Crespo, before my question, I will quickly say that I am honored to take care of your patients at Hartford Hospital. You rock. Yes. <laughs> what are the treatment options for people with AFib? Thanks, Val. So when patients present with AFib, there are a variety of treatment options. And the way I like to describe it to people is that there are sort of three critical issues that have to be addressed. Uh, the first is we have to look at their risk for stroke because when you have AFib, your risk for stroke really increases. And so depending on what kind of risk factors you start with, you might need something like an aspirin or you might need a stronger blood thinner. Once we get that out of the way, we need to make sure the heart rhythm is controlled in terms of the heart rate. So we start medications to keep the heart from going too fast. And then we look at the options for getting people back into normal rhythm. And that might involve drugs or ablations uh, depending on the situation. So it's that sort of three-pronged approach is the way we go out. Right, sort of assessing the patient. Right. And I think that's where, was, you know, having specialists like yourself and the entire team is that you can really pinpoint and take patients through that process and really sort of map out the patient's um, chart and sort of the treatment options. Right. So it's really having that expertise, I think, that that really comes into play um, when you're dealing with this. Pacemakers and automatic defibrillators have come a long way. I mean, they, they're, it seems like they're getting smaller and smaller and easier yep. to implant. And talk to us about that. They're certainly different than they were you know, many years ago, even just a few years ago. Yeah, every, every year they get smaller yeah. and more sophisticated. Uh, and so you know, from a patient perspective, the, the size does make a difference. I mean, these devices, particularly defibrillators, used to be implanted in the abdomen, they were so big. Uh, now they're, they're tiny, they go under the skin. In most patients, you can't see any kind of raising of the skin or anything, they're basically invisible. Uh, so there, there are those kinds of devices. The other changes we've seen are the devices without leads, like we talked about. Or for defibrillators, there are defibrillators now that actually do not have any leads in the heart, but they're entirely subcutaneous, so that there's nothing going into the heart, but we can deliver shocks just from under the skin. Uh, and so, depending on the patient's situation, that might be preferable to a standard defibrillator. And the longevity, too, has increased in these defibrillators, is that right? right? The batteries get yeah. better with every generation of device. It used to be just a couple of years. Now we're looking at, for a standard device, potentially eight to 10 years of battery life. Wow, that's significant. That's quite a difference. Um, we do have another question from mm -hmm. Donna. She says, how long has this type of procedure um, been around? So speaking of the cryo balloon, I'm assuming that's what she's asking about. Yep. Uh, the first iteration of the cryo balloon has came out probably going back seven or eight years in that time frame. The second generation was released a few years after. Um, we waited to adopt the technology here because we wanted to make sure that the outcomes data was there. And right. so it wasn't until this past year where really robust, large-scale randomized trials showed that the outcomes for cryoablation were as good as traditional ablation. And that's what prompted us to move forward here at Harvard Hospital. Right, and, and we do want to mention as a follow-up to Donna's question um, that doctors here, physicians like yourself, were the first in the greater Hartford area to perform the cryoballoon procedure um, as well. Um, let's talk about um, the, the HIS bundle. This is an interesting, another unique technique for folks with AFib. Tell us about what that is. It's actually uh, mimicking wires or using the wires, um, so it's a more natural approach. Right, so it's not just for patients with AFib, mm -hmm. but the heart has its own wiring system. It's not exactly wires, but mm -hmm. it, it has a conduction system within it that allows electricity to travel very rapidly throughout the heart and lets the heart beat very synchronously. All the walls beat together. When you put any kind of pacemaker wire into the heart, or, you know, or even a leafless pacemaker, it's starting the heartbeat at the site where that device is touching the heart. And so that gets the job done of making the heart beat, but it doesn't necessarily make it beat in a normal way. For most people, that's okay. What they just need is the heart needs to beat when it's supposed to beat. But for some people, that abnormal beating can actually lead to other problems, mm -hmm. particularly if they already have a heart problem, that can actually make it worse. And so his bundle pacing is a technique where we actually put wires and directly plug them into the heart's natural wiring. So the, the wiring is called the his Purkinje system, 
to not use too much jargon, but that's where that name comes right. from. And so we put the wires directly into the heart's natural wiring and then recruit that to make the heart beat naturally. When we do this, the patient's EKG looks identical with pacing as it does beforehand. Uh, and so this is a technique that we've actually been part of pioneering here at Hartford Hospital. We were involved in some of the initial uh, big trials looking at this, and it's a growing technique that's now finding more and more uses. And so we're a center actually that's teaching other doctors around the country and around the world how to do this. We do case presentations and do live cases where we teach doctors from, uh, who, who sort of sort, sign in on, on the web how to do these kind of procedures. So it's, it's something that's really growing and it's a unique thing that we offer here at Hartford. Yeah, that's exciting, really sort of pioneering this um, technique and really leading the way in terms of being a training facility as well. And I would imagine for the, the body's reaction, because it's so natural, there's no chance of resistance, right? Yeah, patients actually really respond to this. You know, there are patients who have had traditional pacemaker wires and have developed problems right. and we change them to this kind of pacing system and the heart goes back to normal. And so it really, it really is a natural way to pace the heart. It, is that instant too? I mean, do you notice that instantly? Um, the change, there are, can be some changes in blood pressure and, st and stuff like that immediately, but mm -hmm. the changes to heart pumping function take a little bit of time. Yeah. We did mention that that magic number 1,300 people um, procedures performed last year. That number uh, is, is more than that that you've performed. Mm -hmm. Is the number going up in terms of, of um, this, these heart rhythm disorders? Are, are you seeing yeah. this, this number increase? And, and what can we attribute that to? Do we know? Uh, population aging. Yeah. So there, there are more and more people alive who are over 60 years old. And along with They're that living comes, longer. Yeah, living yeah. longer. And that just leads to a, a higher incidence uh, and prevalence of heart rhythm problems, just like any other heart problem. Right. So we see a lot of atrial fibrillation. We're doing more and more ablations for that every year because we see more patients, uh, as well as other heart rhythm problems. But I think the, the, the benefit or the beauty of it, too, is that everything has become so sophisticated and we offer a lot of unique procedures that folks right. needing this, um, it's a quicker recovery. It's, uh, it, it's not something to be fearful of because of the advancements that have been made. Right. It really is a minimally invasive yeah. procedure. Patients are up and walking six hours later. They have a little bit of bed rest. They're up and walking. We monitor them in the hospital overnight just for precautionary measures. But they go home the next day. They're doing normal activities, just no heavy lifting for five to seven days. But other than that, they're, they can go back to their lives. A lot of advancements. What's anything else coming down the, the, the pipeline? I mean, that's a lot. But uh, where do you see the future sort of, of, of AFib treatments going? So uh, I think that you know atrial fibrillation is an umbrella term. We mm -hmm. use the term broadly, but really in each individual, the way they got to atrial fibrillation is, is different right. in each person because we have some patients who are very healthy, actually athletes who can get it, whereas you can have someone who has a lot of other medical issues. And so I think as we move forward, we're becoming more and more tailored in our approaches to treating these patients, you know, picking out what the best way to approach individual patients is as opposed to the same treatment for everybody. And, and a lot of folks are health conscious today and a lot of, you know, exercising and really uh, maintaining their weight and watching what they eat. Are we seeing it in a, in a younger population that's uh, more physically active? Um, can you attribute some of that to uh, exercise or, or runners or anything like that? So I want to be careful uh, mm -hmm. because we never want to discourage exercise. Exercise right, is the single best thing that anybody mm -hmm. can do for themselves, better than any medication. Um, but in extreme athletes, they can develop heart rhythm problems. Right. So when you so, see you know, sort of uh, Ironmen who do mm -hmm. sort of these you know, extreme triathlons, marathon runners, cyclists, you do have a slight increase in the risk of heart rhythm disorders later in life. Now, the health benefits of athletics so far outweigh that little increased risk right. that I would never discourage anybody, but we do see some patients. and and. One of the beauties of an ablation is it allows us to treat those patients right. without having to use medications because the medications slow the heart rate, inhibit athletic performance, whereas an ablation gets them past it and they get back to their lives. Once you have an ablation procedure, um, it, is that something that you're monitored uh, for the rest of your life if it comes back or how, what, what's the long-term follow-up care? Right, so initially you get very close follow-up. We're seeing you every few months, any kind of symptoms, we're doing an EKG or a monitor to see what's going on. On. Once you get out beyond a year from the procedure and things are going well, follow-up becomes more and more spaced out, you know, to the point where you only come back if you're having symptoms. Yeah. So, so, so lastly, um, for those with uh, AFib or heart rhythm disorder, if they come to Hartford Hospital, what can they expect? 
so they can expect comprehensive multidisciplinary care. So at our AFib center, we have electrophysiologists, nurses, and as practitioners, cardiac surgeons, all working together to figure out what the best way to treat in each individual patient is. So they'll get a comprehensive approach to their AFib, um, not a cookie cutter approach where everybody's right. gonna get the same care. Right. Lots of exciting procedures that, uh, that you and the rest of uh, the team here at Hartford Hospital and the Electrophysiology Lab are, are performing. So really great stuff and, and staying at the forefront and, and uh, with these leading edge procedures. So thank you for sharing your time yeah. with us tonight. Thanks for and, me and talk about it. Yeah, and highlighting these procedures. Well, we hope you got something out of tonight's discussion. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Tina Verona for Hartford HealthCare. We'll see you back here next week. Great.